Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kevin Navani. As usual, it's always about total Bitcoin, total freedom. And my very special guest is today, Sibor Marshall from Canada. Sibor, thank you so much for coming to my show for the first time. <laughs> hey, Kevin. Yeah, thanks for having me. Sib, uh, so I've been following you for some quite some time and uh, you seem, um, let me let me first uh, let you introduce you a little bit, your background, your expertise, your, maybe even your professional background, your path to Bitcoin, uh, the monetary, you know, uh, understanding monetary history, because that's a lot of what you, uh, what you Twitter about, but also even technical aspects. Uh, you want to like give like a bigger picture of who you are, what your path to Bitcoin is? Thanks. For sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so right now I work at Knox. Knox is a Bitcoin custodian uh, for fiduciaries, meaning that we have a, a way to provide custodial services to large institutional investors uh, with insurance coverage. Uh, and so besides that, my, my story around Bitcoin, uh, I guess it's pretty, you know, pretty similar to a lot of other Bitcoiners. I sort of ignored Bitcoin for many years before actually going down the rabbit hole. Uh, the first time I saw Bitcoin was on the Silk Road in 2012. Uh, and I was at university in a Keynesian economics uh, 101 class. Um, and, you know, we were browsing the, the dark web uh, and saw all these prices denominated in BTC. And so in order to purchase anything over there, you had to sort of buy that weird internet uh, currency. And so anyway, so we did this with a friend uh, and actually the friend was, was sort of managing the whole thing. I was just a lurker. Um, and then I stumbled upon Bitcoin again in 2014 when I was in Argentina on exchange at university where um, a lot of students were just exchanging, trading foreign exchange uh, currencies, including Bitcoin. Uh, so it was really like a group of traders. I really was not into this at all. So I ignored it again. Uh, and then in 2016, uh, I joined a VC firm and that VC firm is a Canadian venture capital firm, uh, pretty small, you know, but in terms of like focus, it was really investing in early stage companies and saw a lot of cool technologies being built in the world of crypto. And so we started building that thesis internally. And so I sort of supported that initiative. Uh, and so that was in 20, late 2016, early 17. And so I went down the initially, quote unquote, the crypto rabbit hole, the Ethereum sort of, you know, global unstoppable, decentralized uh, computer narratives. Uh, and so in that process, uh, we've built that investment strategy, but realized that Executing that strategy was extremely tough for one particular reason is that uh, as a fund manager managing other people's assets, uh, you're doing two things, basically. You're executing a, an investment strategy and then you're doing custody of, of, uh, of those positions that you've entered it into. And so custody for, for Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies was pretty much non-existent at the time for as services besides, you know, having a treasure and a ledger. And so our CFO was like, guys, no fucking way I'm holding a ledger in my bedroom worth, you know, millions of dollars uh, of assets. <laughs> uh, and so we decided not to, to execute on that strategy, but looked around for companies that were providing those services. And it happened that Knox, uh, the company I work at, uh, came to light. So the, you know, the rest is, uh, is history. Did it say something like a fully insured or did I like uh, read something wrong, like insured, a fully insured custodial service? Right, that, right. Can you yeah, explain that's that? Right. Yeah. So, you know, if you want to respect the Bitcoin ethos, uh, which I, I, you know, I truly believe in, um, everybody should hold their own keys because, you know, not your keys, not your Bitcoins. Um, and the second thing is, of course, and everybody should run their full nodes to verify the uh, integrity of the entire ledger and make sure that, you know, your transactions are, are, are actually, you know, have actually happened. They actually own the BTC that you believe to own on, on those uh, addresses that you control. And so if 
you want to bypass that first rule of everybody should hold their own keys. You got to do it in a way that is responsible. And a, I would say the, the justification for, for not holding your keys is the, that the reality um, forces fiduciaries, or I should say people managing other people's money uh, to rely on trusted third parties to do it. So again, as a, as a, as a fiduciary managing other people's assets, your deployed capital. And when you deploy that capital, you got to segregate that activity of investment and trading from the activity of custody and safekeeping. And so entities like, like Knox uh, aim to provide a service to those, to those companies and fund managers in a responsible way. And so I would say it's sort of the, trying to build a trust minimized third party, you know, trying to stay away from, from buzzwords, but it's, it's really what it is. It's the reason why we, we've built Knox in the first place is to provide that service without exposing too many counterparty risk to the people uh, doing business with us. And so basically the way we've built our private key management system allows us to, have a really deep granular understanding of all the different um, attack vectors uh, and sort of, you know, attack surfaces uh, involved in, in that process. So from, you know, the time that we generate physical segregated entropy to create seed material that is then utilized to derive private keys of accounts uh, to the utilization of private keys to sign transactions of our customers, like all of these different touch points in that private key management lifecycle are, are measured in terms of their risk and then priced um, with insurance markets uh, in the form of premiums. And so we are basically able to sort of gain um, insurance coverage for that activity uh, up to the full value of holdings that we have at Knox. So what I mean by that is it's not a physically settled insurance yet, meaning that if you know, we were to have a claim event on the insurance policy that we have, um, which covers you know, theft and losses of Bitcoins, um, we would be settling that claim event, should it be valid, um, in cash. And so that means that, for instance, if we get hit uh, today and Bitcoin is worth, let's say, you know, $10,000 and you have one Bitcoin with us, um, you're going to get priced at that spot market price right now. But let's say the, ca the insurance settles in three, four months, because, you know, there's a lot of paperwork to be done, there's some investigation on our systems to be performed by, by the insurers and, and auditors and so on. So when we settle that, that insurance, let's say, you know, Bitcoin rose to 20K, um, unfortunately, you know, you're not going to get your full Bitcoin back. You're going to get, you know, 0 .5, 0 0.5 BTC, which is still worth $10,000. Uh, just not the, the the physical unit of BTC that you initially had. So that is, I would say, the trade-off today. And I'm, you know, saying that in a very sort of transparent, uh, conservative manner. Uh, we truly believe that, you know, insurance policies will, will get better over time. Like it's still an extremely nascent um, sort of risk segment of the entire insurance industry. And so as that industry sort of matures and, and sort of gets more, counterparties uh, like Knox to really push the limit of security and transparency and, and, and sort of uh, verifiability as well. Uh, and truly believe, you know, premiums will go down, coverage will expand and the entire market capacity, meaning that the entire uh, capital that is allocated uh, to that risk will also grow. Uh, and hopefully in the future, we'll see, um, you know, uh, less market risk uh, absorbed by, by insurance. So people getting insurance. Um, yeah.
Great, great. Great, thanks. So um, uh, there seems to be like a sort of a, um, a common uh, perception, uh, even within the Bitcoin community, within the Bitcoin community, is that um, custodial services, uh, whether they will be institutional or individuals, will be dominant, will be dominant, or will be dominant, will be sort of really important still, because a lot of people, whether it will be elder people, you know, or... Uh, they, they they don't have to have like millions of you know worth of uh, dollars of bitcoin but like you know small amounts would you did you yeah. see that 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 progression like to more and more custodial services even for individuals or do you think uh, more and more people are gonna you know take upon self-responsibility with their own private keys and multi-sig or whatever yeah i guess you know um we should not underestimate the fact that uh, people will always put convenience first. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, you know, I, I wouldn't call that laziness, but it's, it's sort of a, yeah, it's a primitive need for like safety, I guess. And safety comes from like this notion of like feeling comfortable about something. And so when you hold a bare asset, uh, and you're responsible for the security of that, uh, it's sort of like not really comfortable because you know, you're afraid that you're going to lose it, you're afraid you're going to get attacked or robbed or, or whatnot. And so for sure, I think custodial services will play a big role in the future. Now, I should mention, uh, I'm extremely bullish personally, and that's my opinion, and it, it, you know, it may not matter in the grand scheme of things, but I'll just share it anyway. Uh, <laughs> I believe companies, you know, like um, Casa, for instance, or or even Unchained Capital for like enterprise, uh, are doing God's work mm -hmm. in terms of making uh, non-custodial, sovereign, multi-signature, uh, you know, services usable for consumers and enterprises, and so. I think that's extremely valuable when you manage your own capital to be able to have the option of being sovereign, you know, monetarily sovereign, like, like Trace Mir likes to say uh, very well, and, uh, and be in control. Uh, mm -hmm. Bitcoin gives you the option. You don't have to rely on trusted third parties. You know, as we all know, trusted third parties are, are security holes uh, and they breach data and if they breach, you know, your personal social security number, it, it sucks. But if they breach uh, your private keys of your Bitcoins, it, it sucks even more. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think in the future, to answer your question uh, directly, um, sovereign, perfectly usable, uh, non-custodial private key management setups will, will dominate the consumer market. Uh, that's my speculative opinion. I really hope we're going this way. And uh, custodial services like Knox, which are sort of insured and trust minimized, will be reserved for fiduciaries. So like pension funds, endowment funds, really large capital allocators that are managing other people's money. Uh, and that have, you know, risk of collusion. Because for instance, you know, another thing, uh, at Knox, and I, I don't want to shill Knox too much, but it's sort of a risk that we've been thinking about a lot, sort of the risk of collusion, meaning that myself and other employees could just decide to collude uh, and basically you know, steal all the funds. And so again, how we've designed our system and how the policy treats that risk allows us to, to nullify uh, this particular risk exposure to, to people. So yeah, I super bullish on, on non-custodial uh, setups for consumers. Great, thanks. Um, Thip, um, so, okay, let's go a little bit um, into other aspects. Um, let's talk about um, um, the, 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 the birth of, of Bitcoin, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. I mean, of course, we, we can't look into the, whether Satoshi Nakamoto, you know, whoever, whatever it is, and whether it's alive, whether it's he, she, or they are alive. Um, but sometimes I'm thinking, what if uh, Bitcoin was fully anonymous? It, what if it, in, any, in any shape or form, technology would have been possible to make it not only pseudonymous, but anonymous? 
do you think, I mean, it might be a speculative, speculative uh, question, but do you think Satoshi Nakamoto uh, wanted it uh, to be in this phase uh, pseudonymous and then later on anonymous so that maybe the attack vectors, uh, you know, wouldn't be too much exposed or, you know, like uh, banning, yeah, prohibition, yeah. you know, do, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, I think it, it is safe to assume that Satoshi Nakamoto engineered Bitcoin in a way um, to prevent the sort of fatal reliance on trusted third parties uh, in the case of issuance of monetary units um, and in the case of, of settlement of value transfer. Um, and so Bitcoin or BP, you know, the, the Bitcoin protocol um, is a protocol, which is, you know, a set of rules that um, you have to respect if you want to, if you want to be able to, to operate on, on that protocol. And so every protocol on the internet or any, you know, just public infrastructure that we use on a regular basis sort of have sets of trade-offs, like you can't optimize for everything. Uh, and that's why protocols emerge in layers. And so if you look at the at BP, the Bitcoin protocol, well, it's extremely good uh, at a particular thing and super bad at many other things. Uh, and so it is, it is extremely good at ensuring that the right access to its ledger is immensely expensive. Um, as a miner who's writing data on that ledger, you got to expend tremendous amount of energy and expend, you know, you know, a lot of money on purchasing hardware that is extremely specialized in order to do so. Um, and on the other end, uh, reading the data from that ledger. So in other words, verifying what is going on in that ledger is extremely cheap and available to anyone in any form almost, you know, across the planet and soon, uh, you know, beyond that, even beyond our, our little uh, floating rock. Uh, and that is the, the beauty of that, of that protocol. And so if you go back to the, you know, the privacy, of course, privacy is important for, for Bitcoin because it's, it makes Bitcoin truly fungible, which is an extremely desirable uh, property of, of a money. Um, but if you add privacy uh, at the base layer, my understanding, and, and I may be wrong and, you know, at the very deep technical level, but my understanding is that if you add that privacy component, uh, whether it's confidential transactions or whether it's like zero knowledge proof uh, at the base layer, then you prevent people from being able to, to verify adequately the, the ledger. And that is a massive issue because you break the, the two fundamental rules of, of the, the two fundamental assurances, I would say, of that uh, base layer Bitcoin protocol. And that's why we have second layers uh, like the Lightning Network or, or side chains like Liquid that is built by Blockstream and other you know, second layer technologies that may emerge in the future. Because uh, these layers, they, they are built on top of the BP uh, assurances of verifiability and immutability of data. And so they have trade-offs also. Uh, they don't optimize for for that, for those assurances in particular, because they rely on, on, on the assurances provided by the base layer. But what they do is they allow for privacy. They allow for much better performance um, and, and throughput. Uh, and so basically make Bitcoin much more fungible. So yeah, in a nutshell, I, I don't believe uh, privacy needs to be implemented at the base there. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's good that's, yeah, you mentioned that because um, I was always wondering because in one of Andreas Antonopoulos' talks, he, he literally explicitly said that uh, the, the privacy issue can only be solved on the base layer. And, you know, since I'm not technical, I don't know, you know, what do I know? But 
I'm like, okay, then what does it mean? Like, uh, we got to go back to the base layer, or it's only so it's oh, the problem can only be solved in the base layer, or then what do we do on the second layer? Then this this is I, I never never got that uh, clear answer, like a clear understanding. Of why is the privacy issue then a privacy pro uh, only solvable? Yeah, and I mean, uh, yeah, and another you know another. Um, I would say really important uh, element that I haven't even mentioned is, you know, it's coin joins. Coin joins allow for base layer, um, <coughs> sorry, base layer fungibility uh, and privacy. I mean, and it's trustless, right? I can today coin join my Bitcoin UTXOs with uh, in a pool of, of participants and get uh, the assurance that once my UTXOs are mixed, they're not traceable. If I, you know, respect uh, post mix non UTXO consolidation and so on. Uh, so there's a little bit of work to be done, like to really, you know, be truly private across the whole sort of cycle, which is really hard. And, uh, you know, I, I think I messed it up a few times. Um, but these technologies are being built. And yet they don't, they allow for fungibility and privacy, but they don't make trade-offs on, on the verifiability component of the base layer, which is super important. Yeah. So um, do, you, do you see the, the progression or the advancement of the technology right now in the, the development space uh, that, um, you know, the, uh, this coin mixing, uh, what you know, summarize Whirlpool doing or or Wasabi's coin join doing. Um, do you see that sooner or later by default? Hopefully, you know, if people don't have to think about it anymore. It will just be by default. Yeah, you know, whether it's on a mobile, no, I, mobile or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, was that was that be wallet uh, samurai are doing uh, really important work in that area? Um, there's also you know join market that's a bit uh, harder to to use, but uh, truly believe it could power uh, sort of exchanges in the future uh, and other platforms with high volume of, of Bitcoin trades. Um, I could totally see a future where wallets by default use, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, make users mix um, without users having to care about what's happening when they spend uh, their, their Bitcoin, right? And I think there's something being worked on. It's called P2, uh, uh, pay to endpoint, which is a, a Bitcoin sort of format, transaction format that allows for that. Um, though I haven't uh, had time to properly uh, dig into this. Uh, yeah, I think this is, you know, in the works uh, and truly believe in the, in the next you know, decade we'll have, uh, we'll have these functionalities uh, included in wallets for sure. Yeah. Great. So, um, Tim, I mean, do you, do, would you agree? I mean, I, I still want to say this because, um, I mean, I'm, to, I'm a total proponent of, you know, self-empowerment, education, learning, and taking upon self-responsibility. You got to educate, especially in today's times with Bitcoin and the, and the whole ecosystems evolving, people got to learn. I, I get that. But uh, would you agree it's like we are far away from, you know, uh, like empathically empathizing with the average user out there, whatever user experience, <laughs> user interface, by default functions and features, intuitive handling, like really people have no time to educate themselves. They're working like eight to 12 hours a day. I mean, uh, may, do you think there's, there should be a little bit more cooperation, communication with, with between developers, designers, um, you know, coders, program, I don't know, you know, the whole community. Do you think that something is lacking? Um, look, I truly believe, I, I truly agree, uh, with, with that, the fact that, you know, Bitcoin products are still hard to use and most people are not even aware that they exist, um, uh, but they don't even understand, you know, why Bitcoin matters, uh, in the first place. And so, you know, Bitcoin for instance, Bitcoin developers, uh, they're doing phenomenal work and it's not their job to sort of make 
Bitcoin easy to use. They're, they're making Bitcoin censorship resistant. They're making it, you know, verifiable uh, and so on and so forth. And so, sure, designers working on products um, should do, you know, more user research and, and sort of work on optimizing the, the uh, user experiences. And, and I think, you know, that's what, for instance, again, like what Casa is doing, um, you see uh, other really interesting open source uh, products making it extremely usable to be sovereign in managing keys like, or, or in running full nodes. I mean, like a good example recently that has been um, all over Twitter is my node uh, BTC, right? It's, a, it's an open source framework that allows for anyone to run a node. And I used to, uh, so I got a CASA node. Uh, then I got a, a Resby Blitz, um, really two really good products. And, and now I've switched to my node BTC and man, it is so easy. Uh, it is super easy to do. And it's extremely uh, comprehensive in terms of, of product offerings. Is it really plug and play? I mean, is it? Is it mean? Are you are you talking like from perspective, like from a more you know experienced user, a bit advanced, uh, or or is it? Do you, or is that like really for the average person that might note? Uh... I would say you know, would my mom be able to do it if she took the time and she was doing it with me? I think she would. It would be as easy as setting up. Uh, our home modem or router, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, again, um, I remember in the early 2000s and we got those things installed at our place, uh, we had specialized people who showed up to our house and set that up for us. And we had that, you know, gigantic sort of cable, like uh, <laughs> yes, in your <laughs> living room and all that. <laughs> those and, uh, yeah, right. Um, I mean, why not get that level of support for, for Bitcoin full nodes uh, yeah. if, you, if you can't figure it out on your own? Yeah. Uh, but if you can, I mean, you know, back in the days, in, in the early 2000s, like there was no active modem or internet community that I knew of, at least, right? that my mom could have used to sort of set up her own modem and router. But now there is for Bitcoin because the internet sort of grew to that gigantic network of, of connected brains and human beings looking to help each other uh, without anybody's permission. And that's really fucking cool, right? So you can leverage that, something we didn't have in the past. Um, but yeah, going back to that notion that Bitcoin is still hard to use, it, it definitely is. But if you look back, um, you know, 18 months ago or three years ago or whatnot, it is much easier. Um, I mean, there are so many more products existing. Uh, the community is thriving with like great educational content, podcasts like yours, uh, blogs, articles, like there's a lot being built. Um, and so I would, really question hard uh the notion that um bitcoin the bitcoin community quote unquote um isn't making a, an active effort towards being empathetic towards uh, you know um, more mainstream people i think we all are but we need to get better at this for sure uh but i i can also feel like there's a, a growing openness with my friends, for instance, like my, my normie friends who are not into Bitcoin at all, like <laughs> I used to be laughed at and, and now they listen to it. They're not even listen. They ask questions, mm -hmm. right? I, I used to be sort of the, the clown at, at uh, parties or, or, you know, weekend uh, cottages and so on. Like, you know, everybody is going against this weird Bitcoin guy. Uh, <laughs> we can all relate and, to you. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right oh man by the way like twitter saved my mental health tremendously during those times uh just being able to relate to uh to other other 
Bitcoiners uh, going through the same uh, experiences. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like people now, I think they they ask more questions. They're more curious. They they can smell something weird or fishy is going on in the global macro, you know, environment. Um, you're hearing about negative interest rates. You're hearing about the Fed doing weird repo stuff. You don't really understand what it is. You just know it's making headlines. Um, you're seeing, you know, the protests in, in Hong Kong, in France with the yellow vests, um, in South America. Uh, you're seeing, you know, Venezuela, you know, just facing an incredibly uh, fatal, like, inflation um and basically you're like okay like i feel like my friends are sort of seeing all this and they're they're wondering okay what, what's going on is there is there a is there a trend here is there something happening that is sort of connecting all these these dots um and uh, you know bitcoin fixes this but for them to realize this like they need to ask the questions and before they used to sort of like rejected completely and now now i feel this curiosity so for instance like recently over the last perhaps two weeks i've sent uh, the bullish case for bitcoin and uh by you know real vj and um uh Saif's book the bitcoin standard perhaps to 15 friends mm -hmm. who asked to learn more about bitcoin uh that wasn't the case six months ago for sure um so yeah, no, I'm uh, I'm super bullish on 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 that. Uh, we'll see what the next six months um, bring us. Yeah, you said it very beautifully. You said connecting the dots because you know the, the name of my show is the Total Connector. So I think there is you know uh, now before we go to this a quote of yours, which uh, Gigi, one of shout out to Gigi who who said you know we should talk about this because you're being quoted. You know, like uh, Bitcoin is cosmic at its core. Now you know it's just the word <laughs> cosmic, but but you know I, I understand something more that is maybe beyond the potential of description of, of verbal description. Um, there is a holistic comprehension, I think, to Bitcoin that uh, sometimes is really hard to convey, to communicate. Like, like I, I see, as I always said in my interviews or with other guests, I said, you know, I see way something bigger than just a monetary economic. It's important. That's the root of, our, of all the symptoms we have. But now coming to you, Zip, what is it? I mean, you said, okay, why Bitcoin matters? Why don't you just start off with why Bitcoin matters from your perspective, from your empathizing perspective, and then why is it cosmic? Why is it so essential, so <laughs> rooted? Yeah. yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, where to start? Uh, <laughs> have all the time, go ahead. I mean, you know, that, that notion that Bitcoin is cosmic, uh, I think was first introduced uh, by the great um, article um, shared by uh, Dhruv, the, the, the co-founder of Unchained Capital, about, I think it was uh, Bitcoin astronomy. And um, I, I'm absolutely unqualified to comment on, on that. Uh, you know, I, I'm not an astronomy expert or, or spatial like engineer or whatnot. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll, I like to sort of socialize the idea that Bitcoin is cosmic. Uh, and that is, you know, I think there are many different aspects that make it cosmic. Um, first on the, I would say the individual level, like Bitcoin is a, it really allows human beings to relate to one another beyond um, borders beyond ethnicity beyond um time zones um really on on a deep deep level um of values um and and empathy and and love and and that has something cosmic it, it's it's sort of i think it was a uh, i forgot the artist who said that but that, you know, there's a song that we're all made of stars. Uh, damn, I should have. Uh, anyway, 
I, I, I think, you know, we're all connected somehow towards another, like mankind as a, as a species. And so Bitcoin really made me realize that recently that we're sort of, uh, you know, we all have the same sort of heartbeat in a way. And, and that, that understanding of, of mankind as a unified species with tremendous amount of, of love and empathy towards one another, I think will sort of help us expand to broader horizons, like beyond that floating rock that we sort of mentioned earlier, which is our beautiful uh, planet Earth. Uh, and so if we go sort of like in this space, uh, you also can make the other sort of speculative opinion that uh, Bitcoin mining um, at some point will incentivize uh, human beings to go explore beyond Earth to acquire um, sort of economically profitable sources of energy uh to to provide you know hash rate to the network in order to to still be a, a you know a valuable sort of uh, transaction processing agent for bitcoin uh, and that is just again because bitcoin forces you to be uh to be a good uh business for instance if you're a miner and you need to acquire that cheap energy but what if at some point in the future bitcoin becomes um so large that most of the uh economically profitable energy acquisition uh sources you know including renewables including nuclear um sort of become maximized then you're gonna have to go and seek for other sources of energy uh, and so space seems to be the the next logical avenue um, and again, that really is my naive sort of um, assumption and understanding of and speculative sort of thought experiment of how this could pan out in the future. Uh, but you look at, for instance, like a very super interesting concept in space is like the concept of black holes. Like there is so much energy related to this. Uh, what, what happens to that energy that is, that is being produced when, when uh, it's being sort of absorbed and, and then transferred to somewhere else uh, by those black holes? Like, you know, uh, this uh, famous guy, um, French chemist uh, Lavoisier said, you know, nothing is, nothing is destroyed, uh, nothing is created, uh, everything is transformed. And so it sort of really makes a, a striking point that we're going to have to find ways to go and creative ways to go and, and source energy uh, and then transform it again to that hash rate. Uh, and so why not explore space for that? Uh, same thing when, uh, when stars collapse, um, they release they basically collapse on their own and then poof, they explode, right? And so that releases immense amounts of energy. Is there a way for us in the future to um, extract that energy uh, to produce, uh, you know, hash rate in order to discover uh, Bitcoins? Um, I, would, I would like to believe that, yeah, we'll, we'll find a way in the future. Um, and that, that again introduces a, another interesting concept, if I could build on, on top of that tangent, which is, you know, Bitcoins are, are not created, uh, they're not produced, they're, they're discovered. And basically, you know, expanding energy um, and of course, again, acquiring specialized hardware to help us in that discovery um, is, uh, is really how, how it works. Um, and so, you know, you need to sort of be creative in your, in your, uh, collection of, of, of energy, um, to do that. Um, and so space seems to be, uh, at some point in the foreseeable future, a 
a valid avenue uh, of, of uh, energy acquisition. Makes total sense. Uh, thanks. Uh, okay, let, let's, stay, let's stay on the planet. Um, um, now, if we don't go into space, what would structurally, what do you think structurally would change? <laughs> <laughs> let's just stay here uh, for a while. Uh, what, what would structurally change? Because, uh, you know, I mean, there's so many technologies out there which we don't know or we will probably for some time not get to know because it's been either, you know, uh, you know, patented or seized, confiscated, suppressed, or, you know, not really made to a prototype or whatever, or, or, you know, thinking about, you know, hydrogen engines or, you know, where are those, all those scientists, inventors? So do you see like a, a, for the first time, a structural change, a societal change, an economical change where entrepreneurs, investors, you know, the inventors, right, you know, without any intermediaries would come together, would be fairly compensate, compensated, <laughs> And mm -hmm. finally get out this, all these other, you know, beautiful technologies, which, you know, make all these, you know, environmental hy hysteria totally obsolete for the first time, maybe, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Bitcoin truly redefines our, our social constructs in many ways. Um, and yeah, I don't think we can even fathom like the, the, the idea of being able to sort of think of all the ways in which society will, will, will potentially sort of like morph into. Um, but definitely, you know, you look at the, the, the space of, uh, of energy because um, miners are economically incentivized to find cheap sources of energy today. Like they're just going towards strangled sources of, of energy, meaning, you know, we have uh, power plants that are just producing at a surplus, just gonna knock on their door and be like, hey guys, you know, we can purchase uh, that energy that you're throwing away anyway, uh, because energy is not really transportable uh, over space or storable over time. And so um, that is again, sort of, I think will be a energy renaissance. It'll create new, it'll force, again, economically rational entities to produce new ways of, of uh, creating clean and profitable energy. And so we're probably gonna see a, a boost in renewables uh, particularly if, if those renewables are, are cheap sources of, of energy. Uh, another one that I'm extremely sort of excited about, which has bad press because it's sort of, um, it, it sort of like stimulates our, 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 the fear part of our brains, uh, which is the nuclear energy. Like nuclear is, is one of the best energy trade-off that we have in terms of, the waste that we're generating and producing energy from that activity and, and the energy that we that we derive from it i agree so, with you by the way because uh, it's been so vilified because of the you know nuclear bombs hydrogen bombs you know all these all these bomb stuff yeah. going on i think it's been really stigmatized and 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 vilified and that's why people don't understand what <laughs> nuclear energy really is you know but but you know just aside yeah no i 100 percent agree with you um, I, I, again, I used to believe that nuclear was sort of like not really good, that you had all these, um, all these sort of waste, uh, of, um, uranium that we cannot really sort of manage and that it was going to blow up at some point at our face. Um, and then you realize that these are mostly narratives. Uh, this is FUD. Uh, emanating from mainstream media outlets uh, and most people vectorizing those this information are just reading the headlines and these headlines or the first paragraphs of those articles really go and and trigger your your fear your emotional reaction to those to, to that technology and so most people misunderstand what nuclear is all about like they misunderstand uh, Bitcoin and many other things. Um, I, I think there's a lot of misallocated capital 
uh, in renewable energy, for instance. Uh, you know, only government subsidized yeah. um, <laughs> sort of deployments of, of uh, wind farms and solar farms are, are actually quite detrimental to the environment because uh, you sort of have to clean the earth of, of forests and, and fauna and flora, which are extremely diverse. Like you basically have to get rid of everything, dump tons of, of asphalt uh, and, and, and then put those, those uh, power plants on. Um, and, you know, I've read articles where sort of like entire bird species are getting disseminated uh, because they're getting crushed by the, the, the wind farms, right? The yeah. turbines. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, so like these are not really talked, these are not things that are talked about in the mainstream media because for some reason, you know, you're seeing governments that are pouring so much money in that sector that is quote unquote booming and creating jobs and all this, like people don't sort of ask the, 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 the tough questions. Uh, and, and there's no real standards yet that is properly sort of deployed in terms of respecting the environment and so on and so forth. I, I, again, when I speak about this with my army friends and we speak about the environment, uh, and we speak about climate change, which is another rabbit hole. Oh, God. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting called like a, a crazy psycho faith, like fascist type of guy. Cause I, I go against their very primitive emotional reaction to these things. Uh, and, and so, yeah, you gotta deconstruct narratives you got to go and like seek facts. And this is another thing that, and sorry, I'm doing tangents over tangents, but that's another thing that I truly appreciate in the Bitcoin community is that this level of intellectual honesty uh, in, in the space and particularly on Twitter, um, it doesn't matter who you are, you know, how many followers you have, how long you've been in the space, um, you're going to get cold on your bullshit if if you don't have the facts or if you're turning emotional. And I think it's so healthy uh, and I'm so bullish on, on seeing and being part of that sort of wave of, of human beings that are sort of really living those values, uh, hardcore and who are slowly but surely, you know, one individual at a time sort of, um, I'm not going to say converting because it makes it seem like it's religious, but uh, sort of inspiring others to, uh, to become like this as well. Um, and so, um, yeah, overall, you know, intellectual honesty and, and uh, uncompromising integrity uh, are, are really important values and, and enable you to have those open debates, um, which are, I truly believe today in the age of, um, you know, headlines and fake news exactly. and uh, yeah. lack of critical thinking, uh, super important. I mean, so many of my friends are just absorbing all the content they're seeing on the internet as truth without, you know, looking at the sources, without looking at the methodology that was utilized to sort of derive the, the results uh, pre being presented. Uh, and so we're basically uh, flooded by emotionally triggering narratives mm -hmm. that blur our, our understanding of the world and, and really confuse us uh, and misguide us and prevent us from, as, as humans, to, to truly make sense of the world in, a, in an objective manner. Like if I don't observe or live something uh like practically speaking today by default i'm going to be skeptic um and that's not to be you know a, a sort of a like negative you know dickhead sort of like going around and like questioning everything and and like is that table you know real or whatnot uh but i think it's it's very healthy um there's, there are many things today that we can't trust anymore uh, on the internet, for instance, like most content. And so, yeah, not trusting by default, but uh, making a, an active effort to verify stuff uh, is, uh, 
is highly desirable. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you because, you know, you said about uh, um, intellectual honesty, integrity, you know, and, and being self, you know, uh, honest with yourself. And I think that's the problem, you know, when you hear from this emotionally triggered narratives as they are propagated by mainstream, you know, journalists or, 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 or no Nobel Prize winners, you know, Keynesianism economists, uh, talk, you know, talk bullshit, really, literally. I mean, <laughs> it's like unbelievable, you know, mm. but, but, you know, these people have got to come to their, uh, to their own, you know, got to be, be in peace with their own soul one day because they got to look into the mirror and say, you know what, I've been wrong. I mean, whether that be corrupted or not, it doesn't matter, but then being wrong. And it, it's, it's going to play along like through every layer and dimension of our structures. You know, universities, colleges, schools, people are going to look into the mirror and say, we've been wrong, not only for decades, but maybe even for centuries. So um, this, this I, takes a uh, lot of humility, you know, and, and integrity. Oh, yeah. That's, that's why I wanted oh, to say. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 100% agree with that, man. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it takes... Uh, it takes ego minimized individuals. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's so hard to achieve because it's, it's uncomfortable. I mean, we, you know, we all have ego and we all have pride and, and you want to minimize that because it sort of, again, tends to blur your, your, your ability to make um, the right decisions when you get triggered. Uh, the problem is though, I think it's a problem of, of skin in the game. It's a problem of economic incentives. Uh, that most people are, are facing today. Uh, Cause again, like you look at, I don't know, like central bankers or, or uh, you know, university professors or basically everyone, most, a lot of people I'd say, not everyone, cause you know, generalizations tend to be wrong, but a, a lot of people are just stuck in, in their, in their sort of day-to-day -day life and stuck in logical fallacies but when you're stuck so deep in layers of, of, of absurdity, it's really hard to sort of unwind everything and like take a step back and, and you know, take a holistic view of the whole thing. Uh, it, it's easy to get trapped into the sort of inertia of status quo um, and not question it at all. And just look at the rear mirror and constantly and all of a sudden bang you sort of hit a wall and you yeah you just you could have seen it like 200 meters before but you just didn't look because you didn't know where to look mm. um yeah um it's uh it, it is um it really takes a, a strong red pill uh like bitcoin <laughs> to yeah. sort of uh start unwinding all these uh these beliefs um, that you've built over over the years um these these fallacies of, of of logical constructs that actually are nonsensical um and um and bitcoin you know i think you, you asked me that question earlier what is bitcoin uh <laughs> i believe bitcoin is is that liberty it, it brings it it removes that blurry filter it it allows you to see things that uh you could not see before um it it unfucks you bitcoin unfucks you big time i'm gonna quote to you. uh <laughs> i tweeted about this uh, earlier I know, I know. and uh and i think i was uh Dan Darkbill sort of uh, shared a, a tweet that he had uh, previously and he trademarked uh, uh, Bitcoin on Fox you. So I, I'll give him the, the copyrights on this one. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think Bitcoin is a economic powerhouse for individual sovereignty. It really liberates the individual. It's a celebration of the self. You gotta, you gotta take care of yourself. You gotta, you gotta get your shit sorted out and, uh, and Bitcoin economically incentivizes you to do so because you're sovereign, uh, with, with those UTXOs, you know, you control those UTXOs and if you fuck it up, you lose your money. And so you gotta dig in and understand how private keys, you know, work. Uh, what is OPSEC? Okay, I gotta, I gotta take care of this. Um, and then you gotta run your own full node. 
and and then you got to learn about monetary history because you're seeing this thing like appreciate and you don't really understand why and you're looking at all these shit coins that are sort of claiming that they're better than bitcoin uh but actually are not um and so you gotta you know you gotta do the hard research you gotta read the hard books uh and and bitcoin again really to me it was it was really a it was a life changer uh and all that everything and all these different aspects of my life uh from you know learning programming because i've been flirting with programming for the last uh seven years and uh four months ago i decided okay you know what fuck it let's actually learn the fundamentals of programming and actually build software because uh, I, I want to learn how this thing works at the molecular level. I want to be able to contribute, you know, to open source projects and so on. And so, boom, all of a sudden you're like, you're educating yourself. Um, whether again, it's like nutrition. Well, okay. You know, because I, I joined Bitcoin Twitter um, actively like a year ago. Yeah. And uh, man, when I was seeing all these Bitcoiners talking about steak. I was like, why are they talking about steak? What's up with that carnivory stuff? Um, and people that I really respected, like, you know, Bitstein and Pierre Rochard and Seyfedin Omus. And so I was like, okay, like, what is that? And so you gotta you start researching it and you start looking at, you know, sort of like the placement ads that the food pyramid of the United States is, for instance, and you realize that these are basically, there's a lot of, of marketing that is, that is being thrown around and the whole vegan narrative is actually constructed by profit-seeking entities selling you um, high margin, highly processed, low nutrition uh, products. Um, and so, boom, another rabbit hole. And, and again, it's, it's funny because it really sort of, uh, yeah, forces you to be to truly be sovereign in all aspects of your life and uh and stop sort of um being gullible uh but being sort of um as objective as possible and as scientist as possible in your in your quest for for knowledge and, and truth um right right so yeah wonderful how you worded that um, so, Thib, uh, you, you mentioned bef uh, before, uh, you know, the, the protests, uh, so-called, so -called, what do you call it? protests, yeah, um, in, in Hong Kong, Venezuela, and now even, you know, in Iran, they burned down a bank. I don't know. I still don't know. What is, was it a central bank or whatever? It was a national bank, something like that. It was a commercial bank, I think. It was a yeah. commercial bank. Okay, good to know, yeah. So do you see, like, uh, these factors, like, compounding, like, getting really, like, in short intervals and people are, like, waking up like reaching a saturation level and and because of that uh, you know they they get these aha moments you know like <laughs> like now or never now if now of course like in iran they shut down the internet i mean it's amazing i didn't even know they could even do that uh, with that kind of i mean massive <laughs> internet shutdown but uh, the yeah. more recent you know we, we should have like uh, work towards satellite local mesh network like opt out of this stupid system and just have you know a viable communication system now where do you see this yeah. going i mean do you think uh, oh, we're going to reaching this tipping point or what's happening it's crazy i think we're seeing in real time the rise of the sovereign individual beautiful uh or at least that's my perception of it and i'm projecting and i'm sort of my brain is tricking me into believing that these isolated data points are actually forming a pattern uh, but let's assume that this is an actual pattern. Um, yeah, I believe that we're seeing people who are fed up with the current state-sponsored oppression um, and, and censorship. And with the internet, you have really educated individuals now because the cost to learn is almost zero. Um, the cost to browse Wikipedia, even if you don't have a mobile phone or, or connectivity, you'll find a way in your city or in your town uh, to, to acquire um, knowledge from these platforms. So it's just a matter of 
of uh, intent of do you actually want to learn mm -hmm. uh, and that's another whole other debate but I, you know i think anyway we're seeing um, more discussions and and more knowledge being spread like wildfire on the internet uh, and we're seeing people just realizing that actually you don't need um, for many things you don't need a government to tell you how to live your life to tell you how to educate your kids to tell you you know what to eat and when uh, or or what to believe in um we don't need any of this the internet emerged you know for sure it was it was bootstrapped by uh you know uh, uh darpa which you know launched arpanet in 1969 and it was sort of like federal fund money but then it completely emerged as part of the open source community and and uh and really sort of grew from this uh, naturally without any government sort of dictating how this the, this thing should evolve into and we're seeing the same thing with bitcoin uh, and so yeah when you're seeing sort of banks um i think uh, hsbc recently um blocked a few accounts of protesters in hong kong mm -hmm. so meaning that you know as someone who's been accumulating wealth over months or years all of a sudden your money is is just like taken away from you uh, and money is you know is that is that frozen time is all this effort that you've put in labor uh that you acquired uh in order to to be able to spend it later on it's just like stolen from you. i mean that sucks it's major balls <laughs> uh and you know that's why i'm like more and more quote unquote toxic when people tell me that you know censorship resistance is sort of like a nice to have for bitcoin but like we should have uh privacy or throughput instead at the base layer no like censorship resistance is all like it's the utmost important um pillar for bitcoin actually the only pillar if we're not censorship resistant uh sorry if bitcoin is not censorship resistant then what's the point state level attacks are gonna you know hit it at some point and just shut it down um yeah and i would argue that there's still um, a few attack surfaces that i think uh could maybe um affect its censorship resistance in the short term but i think again like we've uh, we've seen uh and briefly speaking that the honey badger is quite uh anti-fragile so we'll find ways to 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 improve that <laughs> yeah exactly so uh <laughs> i've got a tons of questions let me see you you posted something uh on your twitter um handle bitcoins are uh, yeah i, I do that there's sometimes a, yeah yeah <laughs> then there's an article named uh I, I had an interview recently with uh phil geiger you know who wrote uh something like that yeah bitcoin yeah, already chain. exactly yeah it's a wonderful article and then you uh, and then you wrote on your twitter bitcoins are discovered, not created or issued. All Bitcoins yeah. already exist. We haven't expanded enough energy to randomly stumble upon them yet. It will come a time when all Bitcoins will have been discovered. And it looks like it will be around the year 2140. You wanna uh, yeah. elaborate on that? For sure. Um, it's, um, it, I know it's an open debate in the community on Twitter uh, and on, on groups on Telegram and whatnot. Um, personally, I believe that all Bitcoins already exist. Uh, like I said in that tweet, it's just a matter of of randomly stumbling upon these Bitcoins as we sort of keep digging, uh, you know, in the process of, of, of mining Bitcoins. Um, and that is true. I believe uh, for a few reasons. Um, one of which is, well, you know, Bitcoin has, as a protocol, has consensus rules and has sort of very clear specifications. And one of which is, we know then, you know, since the Genesis block, we've had um, a block subsidy as part of the block reward that 
let 50 Bitcoins be found uh, for the first block reward error. Uh, and that every 210,000 blocks, that subsidy is halved and, you know, and basically cut in half. And that will go on and on and on and on and on as a loop until there's nothing more to cut. So actually like the 21 million Bitcoin limit isn't written as that in the, in the code. It's just a, a initial issuance, initial, and I actually don't even like the word issuance. The initial set of discovered Bitcoins was like a package of 50 Bitcoins and that halvening sort of make it go until we, 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 actually discovered 21 million Bitcoin. And so again, as a, as a group of human beings resonating about, reasoning, sorry, about Bitcoin, uh, we all know that we'll hit that limit of 21 million units uh, in roughly the year 2140. And I heard it's perhaps 2141 now, but again, it's an approximation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but we know, like we all know that Again, as a hodler who unfortunately, you know, uh, lost his keys in a, in a boating accident, um, I'm aware that what I used to hold was part of a larger pool of 21 million units. Um, even if the one, you know, even considering the ones that are burnt, uh, meaning that, you know, the Bitcoins that we've lost in the early days because they're worth, worthless. Um, well, these Bitcoins were, were just discovered and then like dropped in randomness again. And uh, the randomness is so large that we don't even know where to look. And so we just can't find those anymore. But they're here, they exist. And the infinite universe of, of uh, you know, bytes, um, so yeah, I think, and if you want to push that further, um, there's a fun thought experiment that tend to sort of um, assume that a few of these late Bitcoins may be discovered uh, be like outside of our, our, of our planet, right? In, in, uh, in space, uh, because you'll need so, much hash rate in order to find those those bitcoins because the difficulty will be so high than the subset of of where those bitcoins will be will be so small compared to the immensity of the universe that you're going to need incredible computing power to do that and doing it from space um will be the only way Right. I don't know why, but I had to think of this um, time traveler. You know, there's this letter or this, um, there's this guy from years ago. I don't know. I, I don't know why, yeah. why I have, was thinking of this correlation, this, this connection with this time traveler. With, and, and, you know, I mean, maybe it's so logical because he, to foresee, you know, to calculate in advance how this scenario plays out. Um, but, yeah. So, um, oh, sorry, sorry, I missed that question. Was this a question? No, no, it was actually, yes, actually it's a question to you. Yeah. Um, do, do you think there's a scenario that is so logical in itself of Bitcoin that you, you can, we can just like play out the scenarios, like in the next years and decades to come, how things are going to evolve, you know, with it be the ecosystem, the, the, you know, the stock to flow ratio in connection with the stock to flow ratio, the, mm -hmm. uh, with, which I think personally, it's an understatement still. And I told plan B, that's my opinion. I think it's even an understatement, but, but, you know, we need to be conservative, I guess, in these kind of calculations. Yeah. Um, look, it's, um, it's odd because in my mind, you know, when you look at the spot price of Bitcoin, like a hundred thousand, a million are, in my opinion, like 
I'm beyond that. <laughs> They're conservative estimates. Um, and maybe, you know, I'm constantly trying to like self assess my, my like reasoning and try to sort of pinpoint like logical fallacies, but it's hard because again, like we're sort of like tricked by our own, own minds. Right. Uh, but, and also I should say, I really hope I, I 100% believe in that the model is right, but if it's not, then you know it's going to be a tough time for Plan B. Uh, <laughs> um, because a lot of people in the community believe in that model. I I think it's not a matter of believing in the model or not. It's just like the model is is an observation of the past, and it sort of extracts a correlation between you know the stock to flow ratio of Bitcoin and its spot price at any given time you know, over the last 11 years. Um, and yeah, it correlates like 99.5% R square, which is sort of unseen in markets. So what will that bring to our world once material capital allocators wake up to that reality? Because mm -hmm. um, now, you know, there's no, sure there's money in Bitcoin, but it's worth like what? sub 200 billion dollars yeah it's nothing it's peanut. super tiny it's like a rounding error on a balance sheet of these fund managers you know if you look at blackrock fidelity uh or like even custodial banks for traditional securities like bny mellon and state street they don't hold billions of dollars they hold trillions of dollars with a t mm -hmm. so thousands of billions of dollars uh Bitcoin is still a little like in the universe of capital markets. Uh, and so, yeah, once these allocators start building theses internally and start using new infrastructure to deploy those investment strategies uh, that is being built today, you know, um, I mean, I have a thesis of how it could play out, which is very speculative, but uh, I think we're gonna see like swings of 50K uh, in a day for mm. the Bitcoin price. Uh, we're gonna see a lot of people lose their shirt, uh, you know, short selling or long selling, just like being leveraged uh, and just being margin cold on these positions. Um, Cause again, our brains can't understand the the scarcity of, of the scarcity exponent <laughs> the scarcity yeah. right and the scar never been done i mean uh, never you know, unprecedented like to absolute scarcity i mean you know i think people have really i i sometimes have a difficult time to imagine what absolute scarcity means you know in 10 years time like once as you say you know all these trillions and trillions flow into the bitcoin market what is it what does some, one satoshi the purchasing power of one satoshi really mean then you know yeah, I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. Right now, the, the largest stock to flow that we know of is gold, which is 62. Bitcoin is 25 right now. It'll be 50 next year. So we're approaching gold. And then like, you know, 2024, it's like, oops, 100. Like, you've never seen that. Even like the next halving, which is, or halving, that's another debate. Uh, let's keep it uh, halving or halfin. Uh, I mean, at the next halving, the discovery rate of Bitcoin will be under 2%. I think it's going to be 1.6, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. uh, which means that it's under the target uh, inflation rate of the Federal Reserve, right. which is quite striking. Um, and if you compare that to the recent research that uh, Matthew Majinski and, and Fernando published from Crypto Voices. You know, they do a quarterly sort of monetary based layer analysis, which is. Yeah, phenomenal. I just had him on. I just had him on, Matthew. <laughs> on, on the, on the oh, interview. nice, yeah. nice. A few couple of days uh, ago. Funny. Well, it's like Bitcoin is today, uh, I think, the 11th largest base uh, money out there in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, how insane is that? In 11 years, it went from a you know, cute open source project distributed on a 
on a you know non sexy at the time cypherpunk mailing list and now it's you know the 11th base layer without anyone's permission including right. the most powerful corporations and and state actors and so again if you put that in parallel uh with uh, what we're seeing for for the stock to flow model and, and plan b's work like okay let's try to estimate where bitcoin could be in the next halving era and there's a reasonable assumption to be made that bitcoin may very well be worse uh that much that it joins the top five global monetary basis and so all of a sudden i mean you're gonna have it. everyone <laughs> talk about this mm -hmm. there is no doubt like we've seen the little craze in 2017 um, that it brought but i think it was nothing compared to what we're about to see in like 2021 because there's always a little latency you know the block hal halving happens and you have a few months for the market to realize oh, holy shit like we're actually not getting the same amount of bitcoin that we used to, to be getting and so boom price shoots up um and then the real formal yeah. kicks in that's that's sad sadly or not the, the real formal then kicks in and which people then finally you know start learning yeah. understanding <laughs> Yeah, I would say again, like I, um, so I heard of Bitcoin 2012, 2012 ignored it for five years. Mm -hmm. uh, and in 2017, I started buying mid-year and I bought at the top and I got wrecked, <laughs> but I stayed yeah. and I, and I've been through the bear market and I've learned and sure I got wrecked, but because uh, I also, you know, traded shit coins and and because I was brought into all these narratives. But the point is, I've learned so much, and and I'm still learning so much, and I'm looking forward to learning even more. And so, if you get people each time, and again, like we we all know, again that the the, the Bitcoin sort of halving is the greatest marketing event in in human history. Like it dwarfs Apple's ability to trigger people to purchase their product. I mean, uh, which is it leveraging greed. It's leveraging um, the notion that people at their core um, root desire freedom and money is an instrument which gives you freedom because it's, again, it's that frozen time. So the more time you can freeze, the more free your future can be. Um, so anyway, all that to say that in the next cycle, um, I'm very excited to, to observe like what's going to happen. Um, I think it's going to be incredible. I think Bitcoin is going to go in the top five, maybe even more. Maybe we're going to flirt with gold's market cap of uh, $8 trillion. And therefore, a Bitcoin will be worth, you know, $250,000 to $350,000. And... But that, you know, it's not going to be sustained. Like it may crash again, quote unquote, to whatever level of support it'll crash to. And everybody is going to call it dead or whatnot. But again, you'll have way more Bitcoiners with skin in the game, learning about, um, about the, the technology, but more than the technology, learning about the monetary evolution that it, uh, that it is. Um, and learning about monetary history, taking, you know, uh, Saifedean's uh, classes on, on, the, <laughs> on the Austrian economics and learning the hard books and, yeah, just, uh, just educating themselves. Um, I think it's, uh, it's phenomenal. It's, uh, it's a very exciting time to be alive. I'm super blessed to be, uh, to be part of this. <laughs> Zip, this was great. I really enjoyed that talk. Do you have any like uh, con uh, conclusion, any final thoughts or anything you, sh you think my listeners, uh, sh you know, should go deeper into the rabbit hole or any, any other? Yeah, I, I'd love to be more uh, cosmic on Twitter. Uh, yeah, you I should. think this is, a, this is a, an underexplored uh, avenue and I look forward to, uh, to chatting with more people on Bitcoin Twitter about uh, 
you know, the cosmic aspect of, of that novelty. What would be like one or two other aspects that you want to go deeper into when it comes to cosmic? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, like those two aspects we've discussed, right? It's sort of the, what Bitcoin represents at a, at a fundamental level for, for mankind. Like it really, I feel connected to all the Bitcoiners on Twitter and on Telegram. Like they're, they're my friends. I love them and, uh, and I trust them. And I have a deep sense of empathy because they're also facing the same um, issues dealing with the mainstream normie world. And, and now it's really like we're, uh, we're, we're, we're part of Fight Club, right? We're that <laughs> underground society and, and we all mean well. And even like, you know, shit corners, like sometimes they, they get triggered by toxic maximalists. But the reality is they, we're all trying to do the same thing. I think it's just a matter of, of educating people, like reading the hard books again, reading the Bitcoin standard. I was chatting with a guy from uh, from uh, one protocol recently called Zilika, and I, I won't name the guy, but you can find everything on Twitter. And we just like spoke about about this, right, and the sort of like economic fallacies that underlie the very existence of of that uh, of the, this protocol. Uh, and anyway, it's just a we all mean well. We all share the same. Uh, values and beliefs of, of like self-organized uh, societies and, and sort of deep uh, aspiration for, for freedom and order without authority, which is, you know, that very sort of weighted word of anarchy, uh, which I, I tend to sort of stay away from because it has a lot of baggage that is negative. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think uh, I want to, I want to speak more about, about this, about Liberty, um, order without authority and um, and yeah bitcoin as a as a cosmic technology mm -hmm. well I, you definitely you know you you know you and so many others you 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 guys are really i mean it's amazing first of all the the the, the, the speed at which it's evolving and developing and and i think it's a challenge you know being open minded staying open minded becoming open minded and and learning from one another i think it's a might be might be a real problem for a lot of people like opening up like coming from this mainstream indoctrination and going into this space where it's you know it's about logical thinking it's about you know understanding like the bigger picture every facet of it it's it's i can imagine it's it's it could be it could be a challenge for a lot of people out there you know, oh it definitely it? is yeah especially when you have your family who's like completely against that <laughs> or or the news that you watch that's completely against that like it, it's really hard to sort of like escape that that yeah like that really intensely constructed uh status quo it's really hard to get out of this but sometimes you're gonna get that red pill moment and aha and then you're gonna sort of like dig in and and then you know what you see cannot be unseen and uh, it only takes a little bit of curiosity for people to, to fall down that rabbit hole. Um, so uh, yeah, that's another thing also I'm excited about on, on Bitcoin Twitter is trying to be more patient with no coiners because in the end, everybody is a pre-coiner. Um, and so trying to sort of like give a hand, like, you know, explain what it is about, like, uh, people did for me, you know, a few, a few months ago. Uh, I think if we're all um, patient towards one another and empathetic and, and caring um, while being intellectually honest and really candid with each other in our discussions, I think uh, we're, we're going to see a, a tremendous amount of, uh, of, uh, of new Bitcoiners um, join, uh, join this, uh, this revolution. Um, yeah if not evolution yeah it's really i mean it's yeah. we have no time i, I always say no, no time for revolutions because it's you know it's stigmatized this word revolution so really yeah, really yeah. something a totally new structure that is the only thing that you know holds this uh you know control obsessive uh entities and structures together and that is the mon the monetary uh roots um 
so yeah, the last time I saw you, it was at the Berlin. It was really great seeing you in person, face to face at the Lightning Conference. I hope to see you yeah, soon yeah. again in oh, maybe even Vienna because there's in, in April, uh, in March, it planned a sort of a satellite Bitcoin conference of the Value Bitcoin Conference uh, in in Vienna. So a lot of speakers gonna come. So who oh, knows? Nice. Hopefully, we'll I'll see you sooner or later. You know, at one of those. Absolutely, events. yeah. There, there are a few a uh, few conferences in Europe. I think advancing Bitcoin, breaking and building on Bitcoin. So, I uh, I'll definitely try to uh, attend uh, one of these. Um, and yeah, I'll be in Europe for for holidays uh, with family. So if ever uh, yeah, let me know. If ever yeah. you're around, uh, I'll be in France and uh, and um, Hungary. Oh, cool! Okay, <laughs> love yeah. the country. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, Sip, thank you so much for your time. It was really great talking to you. I really enjoyed that. And my listeners, you know, learning so much from, from you and so many others uh, having on them on the show. And yeah, hope to talk to you soon. Take care of yourself. Thanks so much, Kevin, for, uh, for giving, uh, giving me a voice. Uh, looking forward to, uh, to the next one. We're all sharing and learning from one another. <laughs> okay, Sip, thank yeah. you so much. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao. Welcome to the podcast show by Kay Vandavani, The Total Connector, Total Bitcoin, Awesome Economics, The Hardest and Scarcest Money Ever Created in Human History, Bitcoin.